So uh, in studio with us uh, right now, we have uh, former delegate John Doyle, who is also a member of the Tomlin uh, admin squad there, too, uh, Deputy Revenue Secretary. John, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Oh, good morning to both of you and to the folks out there in Radio Land. Now, some people are saying that I am filling a Democratic quota by having you on the show today. And I want people to know that that's not true. I do not uh, schedule guests based on what party they are. I schedule guests on whether they can entertain me when they're in here or not. <laughs> John checks that box. John does <laughs> I, I'm curious, is John going to announce today he's running for governor? John? No. Why not, John? Uh, now, here's – well, because we actually have two candidates, uh, two uh, very strong Democrats uh, that – and and I hope they will not run against each other in the primary. And, in fact, they have both said they will not. Who are you talking about? Uh, uh, huh? Who are you talking about? We are talking about Ben Salango mm -hmm. is one, and Steve Williams, the mayor of Huntington. Steve has declared – Ben told me on the phone he thought he heard Steve had declared over the weekend, but I couldn't find any news about it. I have not heard that. Yeah. And that, and I do remember that both of them said, like three or four weeks ago, that they would not run against each other in a primary. So uh, I hope that is still the case. Uh, I think either one of them would be would be an excellent candidate in November. Uh, but I, uh, uh, particularly given, uh, and, and uh, Bill, you mentioned it in your in the interview with Salango, the difficulty Democrats have raising money statewide. I think we'd be far better off if we simply did not have a primary. Just because of the money reason? Yes. Because I, w I think a primary tends to improve a candidate because he's been faced with tough questions and he... he he understands the issues much better through the primary process. Oh, that is true. But you're going to see this on the Republican side. Money contributed to a candidate in the primary, a dollar contributed to a candidate in the primary, cannot be contributed again in the general election. I mean, whoever contributes the money, that's a dollar out of their wallet. So uh, it and, and in particular with all these Republicans out there raising money, there's going to be less money available in in the general election simply because so many Republican donors have already contributed uh, large portions of what they have. John, so much of the funding is done through PACs. Uh, and I know on the national issue, PACs are going to be a, a, a major player, a major contributor. Yes. Uh, on the Democratic side at the state level for running for governor, will PACs be that influential? Oh, sure. Uh, will uh, there be that much money in the PACs, what I should say? Well, m most money in politics today is PAC money. But, one, a lot but, of but by, one, by one avenue or another. Yeah. But a lot of my point is a lot of that's going to be directed toward the national. And a lot of it's going to be directed toward the uh, Senate races, whatever that happens, how that shakes out. How much of it do you think will go to the Democratic side of a governor's race? Well, none of the national money will. Uh, the national money would go to the Senate race uh, and and maybe a tiny sliver of it to Democrats running for the two House seats because the presumption in D.C. is that the Democrats have no chance whatsoever of winning either one of these two House races. So the national PAC money would go toward the Senate race. Now, uh, in terms of the governor's race, it would be local state-raised PAC money. And while you on the Republican side, uh, Patrick Morrissey uh, will have some national PAC money, uh, and maybe one or two of the others might be able to get yeah. some. Uh, uh, most of those Republicans are going to have to raise their money in state. Yeah, Morrissey already has $10 million on right. uh, national PAC money. Yeah, and I think that's the club for growth money. It is, exactly that's right, it. club so, yeah. for growth. Exactly. Uh, I don't know of any other national Republican PACs that would invest in that race because that's money they would not be investing in Senate races. There, again, there's a, you only got so much money in your wallet, even if you're filthy rich, and you're going to say, listen, if I give a dollar to Jones, this is a dollar I can't give to Smith. So uh, both parties face that. Uh, the Republicans in West Virginia are far more, uh, 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 far ha have far bigger uh, wallets than the Democrats do, but the Republicans also have lots more candidates for governor. 
to the spread Democrats? that money around with. I'm sorry, you say the Democrats do? No, I the said Republic. the Republicans okay, have sure. a lot yeah, more exactly. money available, yes, yes, yes. but they've also got more candidates yes. to give it to. Yes. So I think it kind of evens out. And, I, and again, I, uh, uh, I, I do hope that Steve Williams and Ben Salango will not end up in a primary against each other because I think it will, will hurt their chances in November. John, uh, you have a position in Jefferson County now where you're more or less in charge of recruiting Democrat candidates in the county, correct? Well, I'm not, not totally in charge of it. No, the, the, the executive committee does that, too. I, about three months ago, became president of the Jefferson County Democratic Association. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a body that is, that, that, that is designed to recruit volunteers for candidates. Uh, the executive committee is an elected body. And that's the official governing authority of the party. But then you have the association, which anybody can join uh, for 20 bucks a year. Uh, and even if you don't want to join, you can come to our meetings and, and, and help us out. It's a vehicle to get uh, rank and file Democrats to come together to support our candidates. And that's the, uh, uh, the group that uh, I'm now president of. There was an ordinance recently passed by the Jefferson County Commission on a 3-2 vote that dealt with regulating adult live performances and consequences for doing adult live performances in front of minors. Uh, I've heard two different stories on the blowback from that. So one, positive. Another, very negative. What's your feedback in Jefferson County from the Democratic Party perspective? Because that commission's all five Republicans, correct? It would be nice. Well, no, it's four Republicans and one independent. One independent. Uh, Jane Tabb became an independent a little bit less than a year ago, I think. Oh, okay. So she is now a registered independent. Uh, and, and but she, she had been a Democrat. No, she had she, been a Republican. Been, I was yeah. saying she, okay. It good. was 5 at one yeah. point. It was 5 but uh, she is now an independent. Uh, my view is it would be really nice if the Jefferson County Commission focused on governing the county instead of prayers and drag shows. They're elected to run the county. They're not doing it. Has the ordinance that's been passed helped in recruiting Democratic volunteers or candidates? Not yet, but it was just passed about, what, two, three weeks ago. I was told there was some immediate, uh, some immediate feedback on emails, either in support or in complaints to the commission. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there are emails, but, but to, it, it's not yet been reflected in any direction mm -hmm. in terms of people who show up at our meetings and that sort of stuff. But remember, we, the association only meets once a month. So, so the last time we met, I think that had not yet been passed yet. So I don't know. Uh, we meet this coming Thursday. What do you anticipate? At 7 o'clock at the new Shepherdstown Library. So, hey, if you're interested in helping us out, please come. Uh, pay your 20 bucks to be a member if, if you want, but you don't have to. Uh, if, 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 if you don't, the only difference is you don't get to vote when we have motions and stuff like that. But uh, you don't, uh, if, you, if you don't care about voting, please come and give us your ideas and help us out. So, again, I don't know, Rob. Okay. I, it's been too too short a time. John Hardy, whose territory includes Jefferson County, will not run for re-election in the House of Delegates. He's going to run for county commission here in Berkeley County. Uh, do you anticipate that will be something that might open up a seat to a Democrat in Jefferson County? Uh, I think it can. And remember, now, that district is in population. It's about 70 percent in Berkeley County. Mm -hmm. Uh, we ran a, a very good candidate against uh, John Hardy last time. Uh, uh, Phil Winter, who owns a business in Shepherdstown. The problem is Phil Winter uh, resides in the Jefferson County part of the district. And, and uh, let's face it, particularly around here, between the two counties, once you get past party identification, geography is the next thing that determines how you vote. And it's going it, to, it would be, I think, almost impossible for anyone of either party who resided in Jefferson County to beat someone of the other party that resided in the Berkeley County part of it because the 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 the, the, the population is so much greater in Berkeley so County. So you think a, a, a Democrat in Berkeley could beat a Republican who lived in Jefferson in that district? Oh, yes. Really? Oh, it'd be automatic. Automatic? Uh, oh, yeah. Now, a, a Democrat from Berkeley and a Republican from Berkeley I think would be a pretty close race. Uh, if we have a good candidate, and I'm hoping we will. 
That, that would be interesting to see if the Republican was out of Jefferson and the Democrat oh, yeah, was out of with Berkeley. With a 70-30 margin, I'm telling you, Rob, with these two counties, people vote their geography. I know that from having run before mm-hmm. uh, in, in, in a district that was partly in Jefferson and partly in Berkeley. I would like to see that put to the test because yeah. that would be fascinating I, during this current political climate. And I also have to disagree with you, John, if you had a Republican and a Democrat running in the Berkeley County portion of the John Hardy district uh-huh. that a uh, Democrat, it would be a close race. I don't think it would be. Oh, it will it, be. It's been for the last two or three uh, elections, it has not been a close not race. Not true. We've only had one election. No, no, no. We've had four, three or four elections. No, we haven't. No, we haven't. Well, John's district. talking about since redistricting. So, oh, yeah, not yeah. since. I'm just talking about there. There, the redistricting was, uh, was mostly around the Shepherdstown area. The bulk of John Hardy's district, I don't think, was significantly redrawn. No, you took that 30 percent of the current district that is in Jefferson, which is blue, and you moved it into his district, and you removed 30 percent in Berkeley County from it, and that part was red. So you've got a reddish purple district. I got to get my color wheel out here, yeah. Bill. Hold on while I <laughs> get back to my well, give us, back to my art. Give classes. us some names, John. Who might run? No, no, that's your job. <laughs> that's your job. That's why. No. <laughs> this makes for good no, radio. No, it is not my job to 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 come on here and spill the beans. Uh, it is my job to find good people to run. I have had conversations with people, and that is all I'm going to say. I do believe we'll end up with a strong candidate. Yeah. So who's on the Democratic Executive, Democratic Executive Committee? I'll get it out in a second, Rob. I didn't uh, say a word, Bill. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. In Jefferson County. Okay. No, I, I, I'll get to that in just a second, but I want to point this out because it's always been a bugaboo with me. Most states with both parties refer to it as the Central Committee which is a lot easier to pronounce if you're in a hurry Thanks, than John. the executive <laughs> committee. But we in West Virginia, being compulsively bureaucratic, insist on using the word with the, with the greater number of syllables. So uh, <laughs> I'm serious, we do. Every time we get a chance to choose between two words in state government, we pick the one with the more syllables. You're my uh, man, John. Keep on the- I'm serious. So at any rate... Uh, Lee Kuntz is the chair of the Jefferson County Democratic Executive Committee, and it is a 10-member body. Uh, You have two people elected from each of the five magisterial districts. You have to have a male and a female. They are elected in the primary ballot in the non-presidential year. So they were elected in 2022. It's a 10-member body, yeah. And that is different from the association, which is totally voluntary and anybody can join. So, John, you served in the House of Delegates for almost 30 years? 26 years. 26 years. In three different stints. And you were in the Tomlin administration. And I was Deputy Secretary of Revenue in Governor Tomlin's second term, yes. All right. What was your main job in life? I mean, like, as, as employment. I've never asked you that, and I've never known what you've done. Oh, I uh, did, professional. I, I sold college textbooks for a living uh, for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was uh, eight years with John Wiley and Sons and two years with Houghton Mifflin. Then I sold computers for about a year. And then I was a realtor for about 18 years. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, and so basically I've been a salesperson of one form or another uh, most of my life. I can see that. <laughs> I can definitely see that. Bill, was that a dig? I don't know. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> this, this is this very is, personable. This is highly complimentary. He's, what he's trying to do, though, is set you up, put you on a guilt trip so that you start, get, you start giving us some names. <laughs> that's not happening. That's it, it should. It it's should. not happening. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, your thoughts on uh, Bob Huggins' situation, which uh, broke Friday into Saturday. And, and actually, I didn't know until I read uh, – the Washington Post this morning, mm-hmm. John Feinstein's column that Huggins had resigned Saturday night. When I saw what happened, I said, he's got to go. Because after after the event of, of a couple of months ago, what they said, said is, one more thing happens, you're gone. <laughs> well, this was one more thing, so he had to go. It's a shame because, uh, and, and Feinstein, I don't know whether you've read Feinstein's column, definitely read it. Feinstein is a big fan of Bob Huggins. Mm-hmm. 
and and he talked about what a great tragedy it is that that he he didn't have enough personal self discipline uh, in a number of ways. It says because he was clearly not only a smart coach, but a but a coach that beyond his gruff exterior cared about his players tremendously. And and it's uh, uh, it really is a shame. And he was going to have a really good team this year, and I hope yeah. they can keep it. I think WVU should right now contact Joe Mazzullo and say, would you like to come here and coach? We'll give you a 10-year contract. That seems to be the name that people are throwing out. But Absolutely. Why, why would he leave Boston? Why, he, he carried the Celtics to the uh, regional championship. It, well, it, yeah, but, but uh, uh, remember, they were favored. They, they were the, the number two seed team, and they lost to the number eight seed team. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, uh, but but still, he uh, he had a successful he had a successful year. season. That is As correct. The first one, that's right, and that that's was right. not his. That was not his team. Next team, because he inherited basically the, the makeup and the players. I, I don't know. It it may be some people would rather coach in the pros. Some people would rather coach in college. If he decides he would rather coach in college, then here's his opportunity. Let me go back to uh, uh, Huggins very quickly. You're right, Rob. He had a very gruff personality, or at least appearance. Mm. Uh, but to say the players uh, were well, – I'm John, took, not Rob. Well, I know. I started with Rob, <laughs> but I'm looking at John. Uh, but uh, but the players really See that, him. Bill? A minute ago he was helping you. Now he's not. <laughs> now he's cutting it. How quick but, it turns, buddy. How quick it turns. But, but there was a coach that had run into some difficulty, uh, Billy Hahn. Uh, had run some difficulty with the team he was uh, uh, coaching. Had health problems. His wife had health problems. Uh, and basically he was out of coaching. But that was his heart and soul coaching. Huggins brought him in to a staff and kept him on the staff for several years. Gave Billy Hahn a, a new, uh, uh, new grasp on life, if you will. Uh, I thought that was exceptionally commendable. He, Huggins did not have to do that. He chose to do it, but he did not make a big to-do out of it. Uh, Hahn died, I think, maybe six or seven months or so ago. Yeah. But that was, I think, is a side of Huggins that is not generally seen by right. the public. I, I strongly urge everybody – to read John Feinstein's column in today's Washington Post. John Doyle is our guest here on the program. John, back to politics. Let's talk about the state of West Virginia and how it has changed from the blue state uh, to a red state. I, I know you doubt some of the loyalty of some of those folks who recently have switched over to red states in terms of their Republican loyalties. And, and uh, I know you have some theories as to why they would switch back in a general election. Well, I'm not, I don't know that they would necessarily switch back, but I think Ben Salango is right. That they are they are up for grabs for particular Democrats, you know their their loyalty. They did not really. They maybe changed their registration, but we I remember when I was in the legislature for most of the time we had about a two to one Democratic majority uh, in the House of Delegates, but of those sixty to sixty five Democrats, there were probably twenty. In, in, a, in any given legislature that really thought like Republicans. It was just uh, a vehicle to get elected at the time. Uh, it, it, you had a better chance of winning a general election if you had the D by your name. Now, uh, because of, of a number of things, one of which is Donald Trump, but not the only, uh, because the, much of the Republican Party nationally these days has made more of an appeal to blue-collar people. And because the National Democratic Party has abandoned blue-collar people and rural people, now you have these folks that are kind of, kind of in the middle figuring, okay, I'll register as Republicans. But these are folks whose philosophy is actually fairly moderate. Uh, and uh, I think the, it, it, a lot of it depends on the future of the Republican Party nationally. Something else that, that is at work here, too. You all may remember that Tip O'Neill used to say all politics is local. It's not anymore. People vote now for people running for county clerk, depending on what they think of the, nation, the two national parties, much more so than used to be the case. I don't know how long that will hold. We just don't know. Politics uh, evolves. And uh, but my guess is, at least for the next couple, three elections, 
you're going to have that, that, that the, a, a much higher percentage of voters than normal will say either I like Joe Biden or I don't like Joe Biden. I like Donald Trump. I don't like Donald Trump or whoever the nominees are. And that will determine how they vote for House of Delegates. John, eight months before the first primary, would you want to handicap the Republican primary? Uh, yeah, I'll, I can do that. Uh, and with understanding now, this is merely my opinion. You know, I don't have any inside knowledge about the Republican Party. Um, the strongest Republican in the general election would be J.B. McCuskey. Oh, you're talking about the governors now. That's fine. I, I was talking about. Oh, the, no, no, oh, go, you didn't go right say. ahead. No, I, I did well, not say. You're exactly right. Go ahead. Stay that, on your roll. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go you got, ahead. You got yes. about a minute. Go ahead. Uh, J.B. Yeah. McCuskey. Uh, I, the strongest candidate in the primary would be Patrick Morrissey simply because of all the money he's got. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, probably Morrissey's going to win the nomination. Yeah. yeah. But now, I, for president, for president. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Trump wins it. Yeah, sure. Uh, because the, the strongest challenger he has has turned out to be not a very good candidate, uh, Ron DeSantis. Uh, he's kind of fallen on his face several times. And it's the old saw, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And on that note, John Doyle, thank you so much for visiting with us today. Oh, you're welcome. 